Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorial. So the world is going crazy for spadroons and if we go back all of those years, I said a lot of very unfair and unkind things about spadroons. Um, Nick Thomas of AHF has quite correctly um, kind of championed the cause of spadroons. And you know, I want to come back and basically say, I'm not going to say I'm wrong about spadroons, but I'm going to qualify a lot of the uh, bad things I've said about spadroons are based on some bad spadroons. There are good spadroons and bad spadroons. Um, but you know, the basic argument that people who don't like the spadroon um, make is that it's not as good as uh, cutting as something like a sabre or a backsword is, and it's not as good or perhaps as nimble in the thrust play as something like a small sword or a rapier is and doesn't have the reach of something like a rapier. But at the end of the day it is a compromise weapon just as most sabres are and actually you know if I just grab a, um, a sabre at random I'll literally just pull one out here. Um, actually a lot of sabres in proportions are not very different to spadroons. So what I've got here is a Georgian uh, probably 1880s um, you see it's got a just got a d-shaped side bar um, and it's a particular it's a british t type of um, early napoleonic or pre-napoleonic um, spadroon that came in before the 1796 spadroon which most people aren't a huge fan of although as i've mentioned in previous videos you do get good versions of them you can get a good 1796 spadroon but this type of 1780s spadroon uh, which was copied uh, emulated in um, America, um, so a lot of American kind of Revolutionary War and even up to kind of 1812 period um, spadroons in America are modelled on British ones. And these are, I mean, they are beautiful things. They're undeniably, um, I'll just bring this closer to the camera for you, they are pretty swords. They are just nicely designed. This has an ivory grip, side ring in uh, bronze. Um, a really nice kind of uh, cushion pommel also in bronze. It's just a very very pretty thing. This one is made by John Gill and is warranted. That means it's been tested and it's just got a lovely feeling to it. Now what I was going to say just very briefly is actually a lot of sabres, okay so the sabre I happened to pull out is a particularly narrow one. You actually see that this sabre is actually narrower than the spadroon but the main point I wanted to make is actually in terms of their proportions some spadroons are an inch or even a wide, wider than an inch at the base of the blade and therefore actually at the base of the blade are as wide as quite a few certainly Victorian era sabres. Um, they are admittedly usually tapered so they're less broad up here and they're more balanced towards the hand. So they're not as good cutters at sabres but they're not supposed to be. What do you gain you know in contrast to that in, in balance as it were is, is, is the nimbleness of the point. They are better um, at thrusting and I would say um, that you know a lot of people will go well why not just use a small sword then well the whole point is a small sword whilst it might be debatably stiffer in the thrust and it might be a little bit more nimble at the point you cannot cut with it and it's quite weak at defending against weightier weapons and that's where I'm coming around to a point where one of the major points of defense um, in for the reputation of the spadroon is that we very often are uh, comparing sword with sword, okay? So we're talking about oh, a sabre versus a spadroon or a, uh, a palash versus a spadroon or a basket hilt broadsword versus a spadroon. And I should just, just to go on a slight tangent for a second, mentioned that in the 18th century when spadroons were being used by people like Donald McBain they rated spadroons very highly. They related them as a very good combination cut and thrust weapon um, that had some of the advantages of a cutting sword like a broadsword and some of the advantages of a thrusting sword like a small sword. So they were actually quite highly rated in their time which is why they became the regulation infantry officer's sword. But what I was going to say is that um, being a compromised weapon and being not as, um, again this isn't the best example, let's just grab one off here, being not as chunky shall we say in the cut as uh, certain types of sabre. This is an Indian cavalry sabre so this has a lot of authority in the cut. But we are often comparing swords but when you actually think about it whether you're a dismounted cavalryman or a naval sailor, naval officer or a, um, an infantry officer fighting on foot who are you usually going to be fighting against and what are they usually going to be armed with? 
will usually not a sword, okay? Usually your opponent is going to be armed with one of these. They're going to be armed with a rifle or a musket with a bayonet on the end. Now this is an extremely formidable weapon and I would say by and large that my view, although in the period they actually debated this somewhat, um, by and large the bayonet mounted on the end of the uh, long uh, firearm has the advantage. It doesn't have all of the advantages of a spear as I've dealt with in previous videos because it doesn't have the length of a spear. It is usually at most about the height of a person um, and it's really heavy. It weighs about nine pounds, whereas a spear weighs, you know, maybe three pounds. Um, so it is a really heavy and cumbersome weapon. And yes, you've got force, you've got leverage, you've got reach, you've got all of these things, very um, stiff penetration, uh, which we all like. Um, but it does have the disadvantage of the fact that it's quite clunky and quite heavy and the sword is more nimble and more quick. And a sword is a one-handed weapon which leaves you with a spare hand. And that spare hand is usually used for grabbing and grappling. Now, if you are a swordsman opposed to the long gun or long uh, firearm with the, uh, the fire lock, let's call it the fire lock with the bayonet on the end, and you have a saber, um, so one of the advantages you've, uh, you've got is you can give good cuts at that lead hand and uh, kind of keep the bayoneteer at bay. But the bayoneteer being able to offend you before you can offend them because they have greater reach, either two-handed or indeed if they lance it out one-handed, they have much, much greater reach. So they can be attacking you before you can attack them back. So therefore the fight of the sword against the bayonet is an inherently defensive one. You have to be able to get the cross, usually to then be able to get the grab, to then come in with your own riposte. Now that being the case, what you actually want is a quick sword. But you want a quick sword that can still both cut and thrust. Hmm, what qualifies as that? So actually, if you think about it within the correct context of the period, the swordsman, the infantry swordsman, be it a dismantled cavalryman or infantry officer or naval officer or whatever, if they're fighting predominantly against guns with bayonets added on, they want some weight in the weapon to oppose the heavy weapon, they want a weapon that can cut and thrust, but they really importantly want a weapon that's quick. If you have a cumbersome, relatively speaking, relatively cumbersome cavalry sword, whilst it is very strong in the guards, it is slower. And the person using the very nimble uh, pointed, thanks to leverage, with the bayonet, you can, you can go from high to low very, very quickly or left to right. And if they're just continuously putting in thrusts at you, you're trying to catch one of those thrusts long enough that you can actually get the grab on and come in with your own riposte. So in many ways, the spadroon is actually a great weapon because it's quick enough that you can oppose small swordsmen. It's quick enough that you can defend someone using a spear or a bayonet at you and still riposte quickly. And it's beefy enough that you still stand a reasonable chance against someone using a heavier weapon like a cavalry sabre or a basket help broadsword. So maybe in context the Spadroon was actually a great weapon. Then again maybe it wasn't. It did receive criticism in period and we do know that ultimately infantry officers more or less moved to uh, sabres of various sorts. Um, although the Spadroon did remain in use by some uh, particular officers in particular nations um, in some parts of the world. So there we go. <laughs> maybe in context the Spadroon was a great weapon but maybe tastes changed, maybe pe different people with different opinions gained greater sway, who knows. But ultimately the Spadroon was for around uh, 80 years probably um, a very, very popular infantry sidearm and uh, they are attractive things and they feel very, very nice in the hand and they do have certain things going for them and you do get better spadroons and worse spadroons just the same as is the case with sabres or any other sword type or weapon type really. So there we go, <laughs> somewhat of an apology for the much maligned spadroon 
They are lovely things. This is a lovely example that will probably be going for sale on my website in due course, uh, but I'm enjoying it at the moment. Uh, thanks for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe. I'll see you soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.